get involved like that. But here's a story that I think exemplifies very sharp in a way that you might not uh, readily have recognized. It was late in his career. Uh, Benny Pumbaga was the sergeant and have, uh, we were having lots of discussions about everybody has to contribute somehow on a ship. And uh, there was a lot of young guys, I think it was the swing ship, and they were having discussions about contributing. And, you know, when you're our age, and, and you're sitting in a roll call, you, you kind of go, okay, now what is my part? And it's very easy for all of us that have been in there to say, hey, I put in my time, I don't have to do any more than I have to. Very sharp went to Sergeant Tumbaga and said, my role for everybody on this ship will be to transport people to jail and come back and transport people to jail. And nobody liked that. But everybody on his shift appreciated him so much because all these young guys hard charge and hook them and book them. They would be out of service for two hours on a Friday night or a Saturday night and very committed to all of them and to Benny Tumbaga that he would uh, take care of that job that nobody else wanted to do and contributed more to that shift than anybody that was hooking and booking. And I think that speaks to his police character and his uh, dedication to his fellow officers. Barry was a very sensitive human being. And all of the stories that are going to come after this talk uh, is going to make that sound like a dichotomy, but here's an example of, uh, of the sensitivity and feelings that this guy had. It was a roll call, and Leon Crumpton had just come back from hunting bear. And had home movies of this bear hunt and dogs and hunters chasing a bear. The bear goes up the tree, you know, the bear gets shot out of the tree. And Lee, you gotta remember now, Leon and Barry are very close friends. And Barry stood up and walked out of that roll call and walked into my office with, a, with t truly tears in his eyes and said, that has to stop. What, Barry? Uh, the effect of this kind of violent killing of one of his favorite animals prompted him to stand up and say to his best friend, I never want to see that again. And when he came to me, he said, you need to make sure that kind of stuff stops at roll call. And so I got Leon and Barry together, and of course they were great friends, and they remained friends after that. And Leon, of course, didn't realize that it would affect Barry that way. And so if you want to see Barry through so many eyes, there's one of sensitivity, not only for human beings, but for animals. And it was a, a poignant moment in my life uh, when we went through that. And then lastly, let, let me just say something about dedication and him just having the staying power I know you're going to think, oh, dedication, you're going to talk about the city and the police department, and, and certainly there was that. But his true dedication, from my point of view, in his heart, was all about Barbara. If you all will remember when he left and 
He, t he wanted to be a chef. He wanted to have a business. Barbara followed him to Capitola, or vice versa. I'm not sure which way that went. But it was so much about the two of them um, that was just totally incredible to me. In law enforcement, we always talk about how much we love one another, camaraderie, and we sh certainly that is true. It was true with Barry, uh, the dedication to the profession. But the dedication in Barry's heart had to do with Barbara and the family. And I wanted to make sure that absolutely that got said. So Gary, thank you for letting me go first. I appreciate it very much. And uh, all the stories that will come after this talk uh, hopefully had nothing to do uh, in my reign, the chief. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know, there's a funny ending to that story, you know. They had to pack that bear out, and they put it on a big old stick or pole or whatever it was, had it tied between them. You know what happened to that bear? Fell off of there into the river. Did get it back. He had that on the tape, too, but I think Barry left it. That show. He did. It fell off the stick when they were going across this river. The bear fell into the river. But one other thing that I want to end up doing is, but I was acknowledging some people here. Uh, we got a real nice facility out here right now. And those of you that were out here back in 2000, 2001, we had our our uh, reunion. Remember the dust, the dirt, the leaves, and Barry and I were watering it all down, getting it out here, hoping it was going to end up drying out, which it did. But this facility has really turned into something else for the city of Watsonville, and it's really uh, been kind of under the spearheading of Carl Johnson. And Carl's been out here this morning giving us a lot of help with that. And I want to really say thanks to him for that, to the city for giving my guests the money to do this. I don't know where he got the money, but uh, wherever he got it. And uh, some of you probably uh, would know Carl, uh, and Rosalie's here too, but uh, Big Bob Johnson, Sergeant Johnson, was Carl's dad. Uh, so he goes back a little bit with the PD uh, back in the day too. The other thing is... Uh, I acknowledge, you know, my partner here, Snack, for getting all our chicken cooked and all that. But he has Zainoda. Uh, Mike Barnett left and he wasn't uh, feeling too good, I guess. And, and uh, we had Oda, uh, Barnett, uh, Snack. Uh, Lolo's been out here uh, helping us with some stuff and, and uh, Carl. So it's, it's taken a little bit to get it on, but we've done it. And hopefully it'll be chicken with that anyway. It tastes pretty good. What I would like to say is that I think whenever I think back about Bear, I always called him Bear or BS. I never called him Sharp or Barry Sharp or anything. It was either BS, not necessarily for what it stands for, but BS or Bear. To me, this is the barbecue for the Bear. That's what I always called him Bear. One, one thing with me and Bear, we go back a long time, and I started in February, I think, and Barry started a month after me. And we were reserves together and then we went full time a month apart. And he was not only somebody I worked with, but he was my friend. And when you have my age, friends are important. But uh, we went to a lot of country western places together, we both like that. So up in the back of the red bear, while Barbara drove us home from the Cow Palace one night, because Belgard had his going to work at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Why that happened, I don't know. But he worked in the 50s, and well, by golly, it must have been good. So we slept all the way back to San Francisco. Went to work at 4 o'clock in the morning after being up for some big now. I was asleep at the wheel, a bunch of other guys were up there at the, at the Cow Palace. Rivers Country Palace, up to Tahoe, Reno, places like that where you have other people that were, were going. One of the other things that a lot of people don't, don't really know way back in towards the late 60s, 67, 68, I had a little run-in with a couple of guys called the Ham Brothers out of Texas. They decided to shoot me up a little bit on a, a liquor store robbery, and they were a little bit successful. But one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is 20 minutes before that shooting went down, very sharp was riding a passenger in that car with him. 
he stayed over that night for a while as we all did a lot because we were short two or three guys we were all craving for activity so the old bear jumped in with me and we rode around for a while and finally he got in there and he said yeah i'm getting tired okay. so i and we used to drop people off at the house pick them up all the time to go to work and so i dropped bear off at the house riding around i got another call then i went down there and had my little encounter with those guys uh, the picture is posted down here at the pd of the car but if you look at that car and you look at the ground that came through and actually get me it came through the passenger side with head high and that was where the old bear would have been sitting had i not dropped him off 20 minutes before so we kind of had a little something together on that, on that particular call along with a lot of, a lot of other things so uh, I think I won't miss the old cat. <laughs> there it is. Okay, snack attack. Where are you at? I'm over here. Well, you better get right in the road. You've got the call. Sort of. we got to have the call get the bear riled up. <laughs> Were you as part of the There it is. Were you as part of the in his hospital bed that day when Zach and I were up there. And they had to go up to take it. We've been walking back in here. This guy hauled that thing up. And I swear to God, Bear was ready to come up off that hospital bed and walk in the head. First time he got in her eyes, I didn't know whole two hours I've been sitting there. One of the things that the chief left, of course, one of the things that Barry could do very well is the chief would walk in the roll call. He would start talking about something new, something that he wanted to change or uh, something that he liked to see out of control. And Barry would question him on his ideas. And the one thing that he was consistently able to do to the chief was get the chief to back out the room. He never stayed in the, in the room very long, and he always backed out. He never turned his back. On Gary. I don't know why. I don't know what that was all about. I was going to ask him, but he left. Um, no, probably not. Uh, he was BS to a lot of us in the room. Um, I rode with him quite a bit in my younger days after getting out of the FTO program, partly because we didn't have that many cars. And graveyard ship was done up with the uh, swing chef. Barry would work swings. I'd come in for graveyards. Barry loved the Corby up around the airport area in the north end of town. Loved the Corby. Problem was, the sergeant on my ship would put Barry with me, and I worked the Lumbee downtown. And I loved the Lumbee. The bars, the action, when I was young and stupid, and didn't know what the heck was going on. Uh, but it was amazing because I would always find the guns on people. Never ceased to amaze me how many guns I took off people. But it was always when I had very, always very small. He always got me into trouble. Um, two stories and then I'll pass it on. First one, we went to a robbery down in one of the bars. It was a cold report. I went to take it because it was in my beat. Barry, of course, was tagging along because he got stuck with me. Um, but it had occurred about 40 minutes prior to us getting dispatched. 40 minutes. A long time. People can get a long ways away in 40 minutes. We were talking to the victim in the bar. The victim said he was, had gone to the bathroom, was confronted by two guys. Uh, they took his watch, they took his radio, uh, and a couple of other things, and left out the back. So we finished taking the report, and we looked at each other and said, okay, let's go out back and we'll walk around there, and then you know, we'll go on about our business. 40 minutes. We walked outside, and here comes this guy walking across the parking lot. She's got a radio. Minutes. I looked at Barry, Barry looked at me and said, Good to see you. Uh, we said, Hey, I want to talk to you. And he pulled the gun. Now, 
afterwards, when he dropped the gun, uh, Barry said, I'm not going anywhere with you anymore. <laughs> Never again will I go with you. 20 minutes. I looked at him and he said, Sure, Paul. It's always your fault. Couldn't be me. I'm too young. I'm too new. I don't have that kind of experience. Um, another one. The other one, we had been dealing with two groups of girls fighting, high school girls. They were fighting over the summer. We had been going to several falls all over town, and there were just two groups chasing each other around. We went up to Burger King because there was a fight in the parking lot. I stopped the car that had four girls in it. Very stopped the other girls at Burger King. Walked up to the car, asked them to uh, go down the window so I could talk to them. They did Lots of very loud, obnoxious language coming from that car that I didn't think the girls would say. <laughs> I mean, these are sailors talking. Um, finally, I asked them to uh, get out of the car. They didn't do it. So then I slammed my hand on top of the car, told them to get me out of the car, and they did. They used their language. Well, the girls came, one of the girls went home, told her mother. Mother brought the daughter down to the office, and Barry got dispatched to the office to talk to the mother, because uh, she wanted to also talk about the fight. After all the said and done, the next day we came walking in, and Carter called us into his office. Now, Captain Carter, for those of you that know him, uh, can be uh, sidetracked fairly easily. If you know what you're Barry and I didn't talk about this, but we walked into his office and they had the little tile squares on the floor. And as we walked in, we started doing this. And we got situated in front of his desk. Carter picks up behind his desk and he looks at this. What are you doing? And Barry said, We're looking for a square, sir. Because we always got called into his office. So apparently, Barry, as Carter put it, ogled the daughter, leered at her. That's what the mother complained about Barry. Um, and Barry's reply was, I was just taking a report from him. I guess the mom was pissed that I didn't pay any attention to her, but since she wasn't there, she couldn't answer the questions. Uh, Carter didn't have much more to say. Um, he admitted to everything that happened, and he just told us to go back out and behave ourselves. Uh, like I said, there's lots of stories. Everybody in here has their stories. Barry was one of my mentors, one of the guys that when I first started as a cadet, uh, allowed me to ride with him, uh, showed me uh, ethically how to do things, uh, how to talk to people, how to deal with people the proper way. Um, I would miss him. Must be nice. Well, I was one of the uh, young guys that she that Eva was talking about. I always used to. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the next part of the story because I would always look at Gary and Barry and was like, geez, look at these old guys here. And I remember one time Barry kind of looked at me and said, you'll be there soon, don't worry about it. And right before I ended up retiring, I thought to myself, geez, I'm Gary and Barry now. <laughs> Some of the things that uh, I really got to thank Barry for was he got me interested in the hostage negotiation team. Had no thoughts about it. And uh, about 1990 or so, he got me to, he was, hey, why don't you, you know, come and join the hostage negotiation team. It was part of the, for the next 22 years, that was the best part of my time at WPD and Barry kept kicking me to do other things. So he nominated me as president of the Hostage Negotiators Association and then he 
nominated me for the secretary for the POA. And again, that was another time that I lost that possibility. So again, uh, the memory that Barry passed on, you know, it's a place of the best parts of my time that we did were things that Barry showed me to do. And then uh, after I retired,